All right, so let's get started on the eagle vision, a prophecy that is given within the book of 2nd Ezra or 4th Ezra. Um, but before we get started, y'all know the deal. Let's ask the Ruach Kodesh to guide this message. Let's pray all together, family. Heavenly Abba, higher in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We ask that you set apart us within the day that you have set apart from the creation of this world and you ordain it and you anoint it through the Ruach Kodesh that you protect this line of communication and you allow the Ruach to enter each and every one of us that are striving to be righteous and that you allow the Ruach to teach us and allow us to be humbled to understand what is required for us to understand in this life. We thank you for allowing us to be here in your presence. Just the fact that we are alive, breathing the air that you have given us is a blessing in itself. And we appreciate that. And we appreciate you sending the sun for giving us this path and uh, allowing us to be washed in the blood of the lamb. Truly all a blessing, Heavenly Father. And we, we do not take any of it for granted. We ask to be refined each and every day because that's why we're here. We're here to be tested and refined. So we, we beg you to do that in each and every one of our lives that is a part of this fellowship, watching this now or later, uh, Abba. And in the name of your only begotten, Yashaya, Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Let's get this started. Yasharala, the ego vision. From Second Ezra. So the structure, real quick, the structure of this study. I, um, you're going to see, I broke up. I'm not reading it line by line all the way through. You'll see the structure. I'm reading a passage and then I'm reading another passage from another chapter. And then I'm reading another passage from another chapter of another book because I want to be able to break it down because this vision is very, very thorough. It can't be complicated because obviously it's a vision that one person saw that we got to make make sense in our own mind for to what he, the vision was about, right? And that's the whole purpose of me breaking it down. And I pray that it's beneficial to you that are watching this. So let's get it started then. This study is going to go in, in, in depth with um, some history and also um, just some historical documentations per se to make it make sense and to show the full picture. But um, I want to say this, I'm not going to, uh, this is not a history course right here. I'm not going to go into every detail. So, cause you could go for days. I mean, for real, there's a lot of information that has happened in times past. So the, the purpose of the purpose of this video is to show you enough to puzzle piece the whole story together, not to go over every single detail. Some of that stuff is on you. And yes, um, some of you, um, if you were a part of the second Ezra's reading, could most most definitely um, have seen a good po a portion of it, but I have added to it and uh, refined it from that that time that I went over parts of it in that reading. But either way, let's do this, Yasharala. So, like I said, the the base of this is going to be uh, in the book of Second Ezra, and it's going to be mostly in chapter eleven. And 12. Well, it is really, that's the only chapters I'm pulling from, 11 and 12. And then we got, I got a bunch of links at the top. 
this is going to be a little bit of air, a little bit of poking around everywhere. So stick tight and let's break down this Bible prophecy. Eagle vision. I, I, I had to think of a cool name for this. I didn't want to just put the prophecy of the eagle or something. <laughs> All right. Enoch 93, verse 9 and 10. And after that, in the seventh week, shall an apostate, uh, that pretty much is like a rebellious generation, arise. And many shall be its deeds, and all its deeds shall be apostate. So uh, a rebellious way of the only way. Verse 10, and at its close shall be elected, the elect righteous of the eternal plant of righteousness to receive sevenfold instructions concerning all his creation. I started off this study with that, these two verses, because man, this is the epitome of this study. The eagle in the representation of the eagle in this vision is the apostate generation. It's the origin of it, aka religion, which we'll get into in a second. And um, I, 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 verse 10, y'all already know, y'all already know what's up. If you've been a part of this awakening, and if you're in this room, you've had to be a part of it, because uh, we're not on a Saturday Sabbath. <laughs> So that means you have crossed over quite a few barriers that others are still struggling with, with me, which means you are receiving the sevenfold instructions concerning all his creation. Is the internet, how's the internet a little slow? Let me know, family. Okay, I'm gonna keep rolling. Keep me on track though. If you're having problems, hop out and hop back in. I'm gonna continue though. All right, so Enoch 93 verse nine and 10 is in a nutshell what this study is about. But, oh, you already know, it's gonna get in much more detail than just this brief idea of what Enoch 93 stated. So let's get started in second Ezra's chapter 11. And just to show you, I got, I'm going to read a certain passage of Ezra's 11, and then I'm going to go to Ezra's 12. Ezra's 12 is the interpretation of second Ezra's 11. So I'm going to give 11, and then the interpretation that 12 gives, and then some precepts from Daniel and in the book of Revelation throughout this study. That's the format of this study. Okay. Second Ezra, chapter 11, verse 1. Then saw I a dream, and behold, there, be, there came up from the sea an eagle, which had 12 feathered wings and three heads. And I saw, and behold, she spread her wings over all the earth, and all the winds of the air blew on her and were gathered together. And I beheld, and out of her feathers, there grew out contrary feathers, other contrary feathers, and they became little feathers and small. We're going to get into all these details in a little bit, family, so just buckle up. But her heads were at rest. The head in the mist was greater than the other, yet rested with the residue. Moreover, I beheld, and lo, the eagle flew with her feathers and rained upon earth and over them that dwelt therein. And I saw that all things under heaven were subject unto her, and no man spoke against her, no, not one creature upon earth. All right, so this is the, the vision. And so I'm just cutting, before I continue going through the entire vision and I read the whole chapter and you don't know what's going on, I'm gonna go right into the interpretation of the first portion of the vision. So we have an eagle, coming from the sea with 12 feathered wings and three heads generally, and that there will be more feathers that will come fr from her that, um, where's that, right here, 
verse 3, that there will be other feathers that will be contrary, different from the other feathers because they will be little feathers. It's small. So there's an eagle coming from the sea with feathered, 12 feathered wings and three heads, and there's going to be a bunch of different feathers growing from this same eagle. Second Esdras, chapter 12, verse 10, and he said unto me, this is the interpretation of the vision. The eagle whom thou sawest come up from the sea is the kingdom which was seen in the vision of thy brother Daniel. But it was not expounded upon him. Therefore, now I declare it unto you. And we're just blessed enough to get both of them. This is the reason why the end times, another reason why the end time generation will be filled with so much understanding and wisdom, because we are able to have all these prophecies in our laps, in books, and we're able to see the prophecy come into its fulfillment in real time. So, because if if we was, even though you could have been reading this in the 1700s, you still wouldn't have been able to figure this out until the day we're living in now. Continuing, verse 12, but it will, oh, verse 13, behold, the days will come that there shall rise up a kingdom upon earth, and it shall be feared above all kingdoms that were before it. In the same shall 12 kings reign, one after another. Whereof the second shall begin to reign, and shall have more time than any of the 12, the 12 feathers. And this do the 12 wings, or feathers. Sometimes they say wings, and it should be better translated as feathers, but uh, signify which thou sawest. And so we're going to get into that in a second. But uh, so far, this is the interpretation, the eagle. We're going to focus on the eagle first, and then we're going to get into the, the 12 kings, which is signified as the 12 feathers on the wings. So now we're going to the book of Daniel. Uh, we're focusing on the eagle first, because the eagle is obviously the base of this kingdom, which the kings are derived from. Daniel chapter 2, verse 31 through 45. I'm going to read all of this, but I am not going into the Daniel prophecies that is not talking about the eagle or the beast that is the eagle described in 2nd Ezra. So I'm not going to go into the other kingdoms that happened in the past. This, this video is about uh, modern day or futuristic uh, prophecies that's coming into fulfillment now. But I will read it so we get the idea of Daniel and put it in perspective if you are, you know, does, doesn't have a base on the understanding of the book. All right, I'm gonna read 31 through 45 in Daniel chapter two to get an idea of the beast that is talked about, that is referred to as an eagle. Thou, O king, so just real quick, second, because uh, I'm starting at verse 31. This is a, a long chapter. Uh, this, this chapter, if you don't know, just to give a quick uh, back uh, story on it, King, King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, had a dream and wanted to know the vision of the, uh, what the dream interpretation was. And uh, they were, he was going to kill everyone. And so the Most High came to Daniel and he told Daniel the interpretation of the dream. And this is that interpretation. <laughs> Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image, this great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image head was of fine gold, his breasts and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. 
And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I mean, <laughs> I mean y'all should know what's up with that is, who that is, right? This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for Allahim of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven has he given unto thy hand, and has made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And I got this highlighted because this is the, 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 the same beast that is in second Ezra. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou, thou sawest the iron mixed with marrow clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the Allahim of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, and the great Allahim has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Wow. All right. So let's take a gamble here at this. Oh, okay. So first and foremost, I, I should have shown this in the beginning. This is the eagle that we're going to use. This is the eagle we're going to use, and we're going to break down this eagle. We, we got the heads. We got the wings with the feathers and so on. So just a quick idea. This is what I, I labeled them. You know, I'm making, trying to make a good little imagery at, at, by the end of this study for everybody. But this is the eagle with no labels. Um, of what there, what is going to be described in detail in Second Estrus. All right. So that being said, this is the uh, idea of the vision in Daniel, and I put the the Bible verses that we just read that when, when it was talking about these kingdoms. But we have the first kingdom being Babylon, and this is what I was talking about. Like I'm not going into details. Um, th this is not a secret anymore. Like this is pretty straightforward. You can Google a lot of this information. Uh, there's a lot of good studies on breaking down Daniel and the, the fulfillment of this Bible prophecy of the kingdoms fulfilling that, that vision in Daniel. All right. So we have in Daniel uh, 36 to 38, chapter 2. It, it's describing Babylon, the, the kingdom that's at hand at that moment. Um, and then we have Persia is the silver, bronze is Greece, and uh, both mentioned in the same verse. Then we have pagan Rome and uh, Daniel 40, and then 41 through 43 when it's talking about iron and clay. This is the kingdom that went all the way through until night, uh, until 1798. And that's where 
um, interesting enough, this is a very important detail. Nine, uh, 1798 is where the, the prophecy of Second Esdras picks up, is in 1798. So let's remember that. Let's remember that. And so now I'm going to, it goes into the actual beast of each of these kingdoms in chapter seven. So I'm going to read on them. But like I said, I'm not going to go in detail of, over any of the beasts other than the one that's at hand today, which is Rome. And as you can see right here, we have Daniel, I'm going to, uh, chapter seven, I'm going to read three through eight, then 11, and then 19 through 25. That's homework. If you want to read the whole chapter, if you haven't read it in a while or at all, it's a good opportunity to go and read the whole chapter and um, gather more information, but stick it to the topic in this study. All right, verse three through eight. If four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from diverse one from another, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side. And it had three ribs in the mouth of, of it between the teeth of it. So these details actually go into great uh, explanation of the meaning when you actually go into these the, the kingdoms that it's describing. And they said thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. After this, I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. And now, obviously, I highlighted this for a reason. This is the main beast that's the point of this study right now. After this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strongly exceedingly and it had great iron teeth it devoured and broke in pieces and stomp, stamped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns i considered the horns and behold there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the, uh, the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. Let's, let's remember these details. I'm going to point out a couple of details right now. We have 10 horns. And then there's one little horn that comes out from um, amongst the 10 horns. And three of the first 10 horns are plucked out and the one little horn had eyes like a man and a mouth speaking great things i beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke i beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and, and given to the burning flame then i would know the truth of the fourth beast which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, broke, uh, devoured, broke in pieces and stopped the residue with his feet. And of the 10 horns that were in his head and of the other, which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until the ancient of days came 
and judgment was given to the saints of the most high. And the time came that the saints possessed And, uh, oops, I lost my spot. Uh, possess the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this. kingdom are 10 kings so they're now giving us the interpretation of the horns and so let's um keep this in mind a horn represents a king aka like a modern day you could say a leader because we don't call all all leaders of establishment kings nowadays but they are essentially a king remember that any leader over a country over a land is a king in scripture even if we don't call them kings so the horns are the 10 kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings and he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws. Man, if y'all seen the path of righteousness is where we're talking. I mean, this is why we're here not on Saturday, right? to change times and laws because that's their calendar, not the most highs. That's what they did in real time. <laughs> the prophecies that that's a, that's, this is a prophecy that we're living in as well, that there were in a time of everyone being forced to live on a, uh, well, used to be a Julian calendar, then to the Gregorian calendar. And uh, Gregorian is literally named after a Pope, which is, <laughs> we, we're gonna obviously get into the detail. This is the beast of Rome, and they shall be given unto his hands until a time and times and a dividing of times. All right. So let's get into this. So we have the, the they went into what the beast looked like. So this was a generalized statue that represents the beast. And so chapter seven of Daniel goes into the detail of what the beasts were from each attribute, from the head to the chest and arms, to the belly and thighs, to the legs and to the feet of this statue in beast description. And uh, just to give an idea, a visual idea, the if we look, like I told you, uh, 1798 is when this kingdom, in a sense, um, falls, and it starts in 538. So what we're looking at is pagan Rome. Is uh, This is what they, they coined it, I guess. Pagan Rome is what is the description before the divided uh, state of this same kingdom. So when it talks about the 10 kings, it's talking about 10 land, because a leader over each land is a king so these are an idea of a visual of the 10 horns of what made the uh the original roman empire and off the top of my head i honestly forgot what the which three kings was uh conquered before it became the divided um uh, papal rome that went all the way through until 1798 but this is a illustration uh drawing of what they're talking about these this entire landmass of these 10 countries was all in um it was all one country that was in a sense 10 kings and three of them was subdued and from then moving forward we were given the divided papal Rome, which was mixed with iron and clay all the way from 538, because we see right here, like even the dates match right here, 476 AD, and we see that old Rome was conquered in 476. All right, so now we now we have the just the initial um, 
backstory of the beast that's the fourth beast in Daniel, which is the same beast that is spoken about in Second Ezra. That was the, just the intro, just to give an idea. This is just touch, touching the surface because obviously this is all in times past and I'm focusing on modern day prophecy in this study. So we are focusing on what happens after 1798 AD, which makes up this eagle in detail. Now added some precepts um, that has the same topic base of this fourth eagle. Of course, since this eagle is gonna go all the way into the latter days or the fourth beast, I should say, um, there's going to be uh, verses in it in the book of Revelation. So Revelation 13, 4 and 6, and they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Is this not what we just like read? They told everyone was talking about putting the, the beast was terrible and it had dominion over the, the entire earth. It shall devour the whole earth. It shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Same idea. Saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. Man, just, just read this with a little horn. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke. I beheld even till the beast was slain. And power was given unto him to control, to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Allahim to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. I mean, good gracious. And he shall speak great words against the most high and shall wear out the saints of the most high. I mean, 100%. This is... Uh, it's funny because Daniel has the fourth beast, second Ezra has a fourth beast, beast and uh, Revelation. All is talking about different versions at different times or descriptions of the same beast, which we obviously see nowadays is very relevant of the papal see of Rome, aka Vatican. Revelation 17, 15. And he says unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. I put this here because the, the, the beginning of this started off remembering that the eagle thou saw have come up from the sea. Comes up from the sea. And the coming up from the sea slash waters is a representation of many peoples, nations, and tongues, which, it, I mean, it, it literally even says that um, also pretty, where was it? Yes, the, the be diverse. Not sure, but yes, it, it gives the same description of how it will be many kingdoms or a multitude or mixed with the seed of man, I think the verse was, but not going to be going backwards. All right, so that being said, let's continue. We have an idea that we are talking about the papacy of Rome. In Rome, the, Rome, the kingdom of Rome is the beast that is mentioned in all of these books, but that's just the beginning. Now, let's continue. Second Ezra chapter 11, verse 7 through 10. And I beheld, and lo, the eagle rose upon her talons and spoke to her feathers, saying, Watch not all at once. Sleep every one in his own place and watch by course. But let the heads be preserved for the last. And I beheld, and lo, the voice went not out of her heads but from the midst of her body. And now the interpretation, which is given in uh, chapter 12, verse 17. As for the voice which thou heardest speak, 
and that thou sawest not to go out from the heads, but from the midst of the body thereof. This is the interpretation. That after the time of that kingdom, there shall arise great strivings, and it shall stand in peril of failing. Nevertheless, it shall not then fall, but shall be restored again to his beginning. And we can see an idea of this in Revelation 12 as well. Uh, chapter 13, verse 12. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. It causes the earth and them which dwells therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So we in second Ezra is described as it shall stand in peril of failing. Nevertheless, it shall not then fall, but shall be restored. Sounds like a deadly, a deadly wound was healed because it almost died, but was restored and did not fall. So now let's go to Vatican notes. Let's see. All right. So I said when we go back and we're looking from 1798. So what happened after 1798 or during this time frame? Just going to the list of popes here, and we see that there um, in 1799 to 1800 that there was no pope, and the purpose of this was because of the French in Napoleon, which it says it right here. And let's just read six month period without a valid pope elected. This was due to a, un a unique logistical problems. The old Pope died a prisoner and the conclave was in uh, uh, Venice. And so in other words, we have the obviously, is, it, is my connection really good with everybody else though? I see Shauna having problems, but it, how about everybody else? I, don't, I, I, can't, I, I can't give a reason for one person other than just, I mean, exiting and trying again. Okay. Sorry then, Shauna. Sorry. Always can watch it again later. So we see that this, exactly what we looked at here, this is when the kingdom fell because it was, it lost to the French and Napoleon. This is why the Pope was put as a prisoner for that very reason. And looking at the very next pope, they were still dealing with it, even they even establishing the next pope after this one died in prison. It says um, this pope was present during Napoleon's reign over there, which was he was the emperor of French uh, of the French at the time. And this pope was expelled from the papal states by the French all the way to 1814. So from 1799 to 1814, they were struggling just to be an established power. They lost their power. Exactly what they're talking about. A daily wound. It shall stand in peril of failing because it looked like it was going to fail. They, they lost, they, they were losing. They wasn't even, they lost their, the papal states. They, um, literally, which is what the Pope is uh, over. So the Pope wasn't over anything at this time, in other words. The, the position has changed. And so this is when the daily wound happened. You can always do more research on this, guys. I'm not going, like I said, I'm not a history teacher. I'm not going to go into crazy details, but this is the daily wound, which I gives reference to this date. But the divided Rome didn't stop here, even though they have it stopping here, but it sort of does stop there in the book of Daniel. So, oh, and I wanted to go into this. This is the Pope. If we go, this is the Pope right here. Pius the sixth is the one that was imprisoned during the, the French 
intrusion and take it captive and end up dying in prison. Just go, just showing a little bit of, just a little bit of insight here. It says that Pius VI condemned the French Revolution and the suppression of the Gallican Church that resulted from it. French troops commanded by Napoleon uh, Bonaparte defeated the papal army and occupied the papal states. And this was actually saying it started in 19, I mean, 1796, but in 1798, the Upon his refusal to renounce his temporary power, Pius was taken prisoner and transported to French, and he died 18 months later. So that's just a quick little idea of what was going on at the time of the daily wound, that he almost failed, but obviously we still see the papacy till, uh, till this day, so it was restored. And this is my understanding of exactly the timing of the daily wound. You can always do more research, just give you a quick understanding. All right. Uh, all right, let me go down. Okay. I think that's it right now. Yep. Yep, we'll, we'll keep going. All right, so now we have an understanding that the, the the main beast, the body of the beast, the origin of this beast is papal Rome. All right. This has not changed, even though they had the deadly wound right around the late 1700s. But this kingdom is still here. It was restored as the Bible states or scripture states. Now let's continue. Second Ezra 11, verse 11 and on. And I numbered, so now we're going over the more attributes of the bird, which we now know is from the eagle, which is papal Rome from the book of Daniel. And I numbered her contrary feathers, and behold, there were eight of them. So if we actually go up real quick, it says that, it, it had 12 feathered wings and three heads. And then we see that there are eight contrary uh, feathers. So just want to make a note that that is tw uh, 20 total feathers. 20 total feathers. 12 regular feathers and eight contrary feathers. Meet, which is where we'll see that they're just smaller feathers, but there's 20 feathers on the wings of this three headed eagle. Okay. And let me show. So we have the three headed eagle and 14 right here, and then six on this side. So we have 12 feathers and then eight smaller feathers. And I looked and behold, on the right side, there, there arose one feather and rained over all the earth. And so it was that when it rained, the end of it came and the place thereof appeared no more. So the next following stood up and rained and had a great time. And it happened that when it rained, the end of it came also like as the first, so that it appeared no more. And uh, I actually wanted to make a comment. When it says, the body says, watch not all at once, sleep everyone in his own place and watch by course. I wanted to just mention that my interpretation of this is telling us that these are mortal men. These are mortal men. That's why it says, sleep everyone in his own place and watch by course, because, I mean, sleeping is an interpretation of uh, as another term for dying most of the time. So these kings that we're gonna be reading about, you see they reign and then they don't reign. It's because this is mortal men reigning and dying. Continuing, 
And it happened that when it rained, the end of it came also like as the first, so that it appeared no more. Then came there a voice unto it and said, Hear thou that has borne rule over the earth so long. This I say unto thee, before thou beginneth be, uh, to appear no more, there shall none after thee attain unto thy time, neither unto the half thereof. Then arose the third and reigned as the other before and appeared no more also. So went, so went it with all the residue one after another as that everyone reigned and then appeared no more. Then I beheld and lo, in process of time, the feathers that followed stood up upon the right side that they might reign might rule also but some of them ruled but within a while they appeared no more for some of them were set up but ruled not after this i looked and behold the 12 feather feathers appeared no more nor the two little feathers so 14 feathers and there was no more upon the eagle's body but three heads that rested is six little feathers. So we, I said originally 20 feathers. We have 12 plus two, and there was eight small feathers, and only two of the eight is gone. So that means the last will be six of the eight little feathers, of the contrary feathers, and that will give us 20, like stated. 12 plus two plus six is 20. So in other words, we're just keeping us on track to the visual that we have. So after 12 regular feathers and two little feathers, the only thing that's left remaining is the three heads and six little feathers. Verse 24, then saw I also that, the, that two little feathers divided themselves from the six and remained under the head that was upon the right side for the four continued in their place. This is what we get this visual right here. They were attached to the wing, but four stayed in his place and the other two divided themselves. All right, so stopping there in chapter of 11, second Ezra, we're gonna to go to the interpretation in chapter 12. And whereas thou saw if the eight small under feathers sticking to her wings. This is the interpretation that in him there shall arise eight kings whose times shall be but short and their years swift. And two of them shall perish the middle time approaching. Four shall be kept until their end begin to approach, but two shall be kept unto the end. And uh, man, I've been very vocal on the fact that the Antichrist is already here. And just the same idea as I say that they could be building a third temple in Israel, the state of Israel right now, even though it's not biblical, doesn't mean they're not going to do it. And the same thing right here, there is, I, I'm going to straight up say it, the, th this prophecy is confirming that there is going to be two an idea of an antichrist and a false prophet. There's going to be two kings, leaders, that will be left until the end times. And we actually see an idea of this. If we remember that the horns, uh, I'm not even going to go up. The horns represent kings. Remember the 10 horns? And then it was a, a little horn that came forth, which was the papacy from the 10 in the uh, book of Daniel. Well, if we keep that same uh, knowledge in Revelation 13, 11, and I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. Two shall be kept until the end. The two horns represent two kings. It really does look like the formula is the, the great tribulation will have a two leader format, a uh, king format, uh, sort of kind of like the, like I said, the uh, the beast and the 
false prophet mentioned in Revelation, which we'll touch on in a second. So now we read enough about the eagle that I'm going to go ahead and get into the very thick of it, into the meat of breaking down most of the interpretation of the eagle before we continue. We need to wrap our heads around uh, some of what we read, or it's going to get, you know, too hard to keep track of what we're reading. Because it's a lot. All right. So we have this eagle. It talks about all these feathers. And it, it going up, it says that the second feather, there shall none after thee attain unto thy time, neither unto the half thereof. Well, before we get into that, let's I'm going to go over the two heads, which will give reasons to of the feathers. So let's go over the two heads first. I'm uh, hopefully in this video, let me know if this video starts skipping because um, I know my internet is sketch, but I'm gonna play this video. It's about two and a half minutes. Let me know if it's, if it's solid, but let's play it. Sobering study of the signed treaties and charters between Britain and the United States exposes a shocking truth the United States has always been, and still is, a British crown colony. King James I was famous not for just changing the Bible into the King James Version, but for signing the first charter of Virginia in 1606. That charter granted America's British forefathers a license to settle and colonize America. The charter also guaranteed that future kings and queens of England would have sovereign authority over all the citizens and colonized land in America stolen from the Indians. After America declared its independence from Great Britain, the Treaty of 1783 was signed. That treaty specifically identifies the King of England as the Prince of the United States and contradicts the belief that America won the War of Independence. Although King George III of England gave up most of his claims over his American colonies, he kept his right to continue receiving payment for his business venture of colonizing America. If America had really won the War of Independence, they would never have agreed to pay debts and reparations to the King of England. When Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, the US President was made subservient to the King of England. The 13th Amendment is called the Title of Nobility Amendment and forbids US Presidents and their officials from using royal titles like King or Prince or Baron. For some mysterious reason, the 13th Amendment, which was ratified in 1810, no longer appears on current copies of the Constitution. America's blood-soaked war of independence against the British bankrupted America and turned its citizens into permanent debt slaves of the king. In the War of 1812, the British torched and burned to the ground the White House and all U.S. government buildings and destroyed ratification records of the U.S. Constitution. One century later, a corrupt U.S. Congress committed the biggest theft in world history. They passed Paul Warburg's Federal Reserve Act in 1913, handing over America's gold and silver reserves and total control of America's economy to the Rothschild banksters. Most Americans still believe that the Fed... All right. That's enough of that. That's just to give a general idea that America isn't what you think it is. It's a corporation that is ran by the by uh, London and the Rothschilds, bakers. And you know, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother study. But that's just to give a general idea that America isn't its own. So going into the next point here, we have. We have the Districts of Columbia Organic Act of 1871. And this is very pivotal, very pivotal. This is an act Congress that re, uh, repealed the individual charters of the cities of Washington and Georgetown and established a new ter uh, territorial government for the whole of District of Columbia. So District of Columbia, AKA Washington DC became its own sovereign state in 1871. So we see that the 
the, the states of the Americas is a corporation business, which is, which is actually overseen by and uh, controlled by the UK. And the District of Columbia became its own sovereign state in 1871. So now let's continue with that. Uh, so we see way before then that America has been over, um, has been under uh, British control. Very important detail here. So now let's take this. I would have did the website, but they the the website that did this article has taken down this uh, specific article. So I ended up having this printed. So this is a picture of, uh, of what I took, but. Uh, going over the deception of this act and what it enabled that has everything to do with this Bible prophecy. Yes, over China too. Very important detail. Thank you, Solomon. Um, actually, I think it actually says that. Let me, let me, let me, you know what? Let me let it finish because I think it actually goes over that it's over even more than just America. I'll let it finish. Federal Reserve is a government. It is not. The Fed is a privately owned banking system whose majority Class A shareholders are the Rothschilds, Warburgs, Kuhn and Loeb, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Israel Seif, and the Lehman Brothers. This private banking cartel is the Fed and is never audited and never pays taxes. They print and design America's money, which displays their symbols of an Egyptian pyramid, a Masonic all-seeing eye, and the words in God we trust. Who exactly is the God they trust? Never mind. It doesn't mention it. Oh, well. All right. So now going into the uh, Organic Act of 1871, like what does this really mean in a sense of especially this prophecy that we're talking about? How, why was it a big deal for Washington, D.C. to become its own sovereign state? Um, so there's two constitu uh, constitutions in the United States. First was suspended uh, in favor of the Vatican Corporation, 1871. Um, Pope meeting board of directors of the Vatican Bank since 1871. The United States president and the United States Congress have been playing politics under a different set of rules and policies. The American people do not know that there are two constitutions in the United States. The first penned by the leaders of the newly independent states of the United States in 1776. The people claimed their independence from Brit, uh, Britain and democracy was born. And we just saw the video that that was uh, pretty much baloney. It didn't last long. The freedom ended in, uh, well, like I said, kind of before this, but we're talking about, this is gonna hit right on uh, the topic of this act. The constitution for the United States was changed to the constitution of the, uh, of the United States of America. Just reading, I'm just gonna read the highlighted portions. The act of 1871 was passed with no constitutional authority to do so. Congress created a separate form of government for the District of Columbia. With the passage of the act of, of 1871, a city state, a state within a, a state called the District of Columbia located in 10 square miles of land in the heart of Washington was formed with its own flag in its own independent constitution, the United States secret second constitution. Washington District of Columbia has three red stars, which symbolizes a city state within three city empire. A three city empire. The three city empire consists of Washington, D.C. And who's over Washington, D.C.? London. And who's over London? Vatican City. When you look into all three of these within their own country, Washington, D.C. is its own sovereign state. London in the U.K. is its own sovereign state. Vatican City within Rome is its own sovereign state. This is important because they, they, they act on their own accord, hence the head. And like I said, 
what whoever is attached to the Vatican, Rome is a part of the eagle because it is the structure of the eagle. And we and um man, I don't know where it was, but like Solomon said, and when people think it's Russia and Rome, no, I mean Russia and China or something, you go into details. Russia and China is also under Vatican as well, but they're not a part of the three heads. This is the three empire city heads. In plain sight, uh, just disguised through politics. Bible prophecy disguised in politics. All right, London is the corporate center of the three city states. It controls the world economically. And you can really... That, that is so factual because the world time clock is literally based off of London because they control the economic values of the world. Washington's District of Columbia City, it, City State is in charge of the military. This is vital, family. America has been a military structure that's been controlling the world in our entire lives since we've known about it. America has been, has won all the world wars and has been in control since they've been a part, since they've been relevant. They supposedly won their first, the Revolution War. They won all the wars. I don't even need to go over all of them, but that's what military are a part of the heads. And then, of course, Vatican controls is under a disguise of a spiritual guidance. Um. Yeah, although geographically separate, the city-states of London, Vatican, and Washington, D.C. are interlocked as the empire of the city. Vatican, of course. And no, let's make sure we're saying them right, family. The Vatican City is not Rome. So the origin of this, in a sense, in Bible prophecy, people call it Rome, but this is more talking about the papal seat. This is not talking about Rome as a country. This is not talking about America as a country. This is not talking about uh, the uh, UK as a country. These are, that's why I was making it clear that when we get into the details, these are talking about the individuality of Vatican, AKA the Papal Sea, Washington, D.C., and the UK. I mean, and excuse me, and London. Just want to make sure we know the details and we get the details because uh, they matter. And then now in closing, who is the leader of all the heads? The Act of 1871 put the United States back under British rule, which kind of happened before then, but this just sets up the hierarchy of the heads in 1871 made it made it made it clear and refined in that and then they, we're under british rule but british rule which is under the vatican rule all right so we have we 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 we, we heard the description of district of columbia's flag washington dc's flag is this right here three states under one empire with two stripes in plain sight family this is vatican being the big head and then you have dc in london we have three state empire with two wings in plain sight three state empires for one empire with two wings that is what I, in plain sight, what I believe the Washington, D.C. flag is. So this is the interpretation of the heads. As clear as day when we look into history, politics, and even of image as the flag. So that being said, I want to, oops, I want to, go into more detail when we go in back to the popes. Let me go ahead and X out some of this stuff. Okay. So now we go to, we just read over and over again about 
the act of the act of 1871. So let's go to the Pope and the presidency during this time. Why was 1870, uh, oh, my bad, not 18, not pointing out 1871. Let's get out of that. So that established the, the groundwork for the three-headed eagle, but the three-headed eagle was not ready yet in 1871. And I'm going to show you why. We remember around uh, 1800, Vatican was not its own state anymore. That's why it literally says right here, expelled from the papal states by the French. They were, and, and even though time has passed, and I know we were talking about 1871 over here, but it, it see, lost the papal states to Italy. The Vatican was not prepared to become uh, to be refined back to its original power. The original power that it has, that it had prior to this, of them having their own uh, papal states in control over their own dominion, making them a king of their land, was taken away at the end of the 1700s, and it wasn't gained back all the way until right here the side the Lateran treaty and we read it right here the agreements between the kingdom of italy under king victory may the third of italy and the holy see under pope pius the sixth to settle the long-standing roman question the treaty and the uh, well and then that is the establishment as we read in 1929, the establishing of Vatican City as a sovereign state. And so what happened in 1929, the Pope officially became a king again. Because what is a king? A king is a ruler over land. This was taken away, expelled from the Papal States. And once again, expelled from the Papal States. They lost their kingship, which is the womb that was healed all the way from the late 1700s until 1929 is when they became a king of Vatican City again and it became their own sovereign state. And this was in 1929. Very important detail, very important that this happened, the, the completion of the third eagle head. Coming back to his full power. Happened in 19, uh, 1929. All right, that being said, it's really important. And I even want to specify that this Pope came into power in 1922. But it's not about when this Pope came into power. It's when he became a king again, a.k.a. the eagle head in 1929. All right. That being said, brought all this together. So because we go to the presidency and at the same exact year of 1929, we have President Hoover coming into power. Why is this important? Why is 1929 President Hoover to 1929 of the Pope becoming a king over Vatican City again? Because it completes this head to move forward with Bible prophecy. But real quick, before we continue, before I go into the wings, I want to hit on something real quick. Before we get into the wings, and we're going to see why I'm going to, in other words, the wings, the feathers on the wings start in President Hoover. That's why it's such an important detail. Because 1929, he became a king, which establishes the eagle, the three-headed eagle. And right when the three-headed eagle gets established, because we, we, um, we, we the whole thing we just read about, 
that we had we had uh, London. London's been in control. It's been it's uh I forget the year, but I want to say in the 1600s that 1600s is when the uh, the uh, London was already its own state, and then in the 1871, British Columbia became its own state, and the the Vatican City was its own state until the late. 1700s until and then it didn't come become its own state until 1929 so in other words the first time that all three heads was its own state sovereign state the very first time at this they were all their own heads was in 1929 and that is the beginning of the eagle just want to make sure i'm very clear about all of this all right so now that being said Check this out, family. Before I go into the feathers, I want to finish talking about the, the head of the three heads, the, the big head, <laughs> the papal seat, which controls the entire eagle. Yes, all planned out. This goes to show you that the world is ran by fallen angels that doesn't die, that they can control and manipulate something to build something to come, regardless of who dies or not. This is a ran by higher powers in higher in, in, in the, the heavens. All right, so check this out. We've we've known we've been taught seeing the number eight everywhere, right? Well, this is the first pope since the 1929. Then we have two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, the eighth pope, I think, is the last pope. There's no coincidence that we are in the time that the pope that is in reign is the eighth king since the eagle has been established from his uh, from the healing of his daily womb. And so let's go into a little bit about this eighth pope from the time they reestablished the kingship in 1929. Oh, I also want to show this as well. Just a little, I thought it was interesting how one of the popes, the uh, the fifth pope was only in, in established for 33 days. Just thought that was interesting point throwing that out there. But now let's go to the shield, their seal. We're uh, looking at all this eighth day stuff. Let's go into the seal of the eighth pope. He's the first Jesuit pope, and we're going to go into that. And he has an eight-pointed star in a pine cone. Wow. All right. Let's decode this. He's a Jesuit, the first Jesuit pope. Eight pointed star, pine cone. Let's get into the nitty gritty. So, I'm just going to say um, we are in the age of awakening, right? And this is not really even just talking about us in the truth. There is an awakening happening in New Age, in QUNON, in, in, in all walks of life, wisdom is increasing in all walks, truly. More than ever before. A pine cone is a representation of enlightenment. Enlightenment. Pine cone is a representation of your pineal gland. Get it? Pine cone. So we're in the age of enlightenment. And now let's, uh, and we're going to see that later. Uh, so remember, age of enlightenment and what this means. And then we have uh, the eight-pointed star on, with the eighth king from the time they reestablished the kingship. The eight-pointed star is uh, associated with the planet Venus, which is also known as the morning star. That's biblical. Eight-pointed star is a representation of the morning star. And then we see 
even though this is different, usually they look like this. And I didn't want to show it like, I want to make it clear that this is what the Jesuit sign looks like. We go like just looking at it. I want to make it clear. This is what the Jesuit sign look like. You can look at all the different ones. Majority of them has a hollowed out uh, sun, right? A hollowed out sun. Very, very important detail I want to uh, get across here. Oh, I forgot to read this. Good gracious. I'll touch on that before we get to, before we get, I, I, I wanted to read that real quick. But uh, we have a dark middle, in other words. And so just showing some scripture, uh, Lucifer is son of the morning, but all the, he's saying, son of the morning, how's thou been cut down? In other words, they, he's fallen because all angels, all sons of the most high are technically morning stars. But Lucifer was a morning star, but he's fallen from heaven. So morning star, you've fallen from heaven. That's what this is saying. But because we see that Messiah is the, the angel of the most high, the son of the most high. So he is known as the bright, the bright and morning star. But I say all of this because we have a strong delusion of a false enlightenment from a false morning star, a.k.a. angel, that is represented by the Jesuit symbol of the sun. So let's get into that. And that is... Apollo, I've been saying it, Apollo, that's why he, it literally says that Apollo is king. He is the white, right, white uh, rider of the white horse in Revelation chapter six, verse two of the first seal. And it tells us in chapter nine of Revelation that he is king, king over them in, in the book of Revelation, the angel of the bottomless pit. And then you can see another that he's written throughout the Bible. That's why I wrote him in uh, show one precept to show you that he's in the Old Testament as well. This guy is not nothing new with him. And I also want to show that the papal see, understanding what we're looking at, that this is the papal see, sun worshiping. And that this is Apollo. And his planet is the sun, but the sun isn't a planet, but he's he's a representation of the sun is Sunday worship. And he is God of oracles, sunlight, and knowledge. And knowledge. In other words, this is his em emblem, <laughs> is the point I'm making. This emblem is uh, the Pope, the standing, the eighth Pope standing in right now is a representation of their king. Oops. Of their king, which is clearly said, and they had a king over them. The, the, the eighth Pope is the Pope that is the false prophet representation for Apollo in these latter days. And I also pointed out that Apollo is the black sun. So with the idea that Apollo is the black sun, and we see this, the, the, the sign, the, the emblem for Jesuits, we can look at this and see that the black sun is the solar total solar eclipse in plain sight. The Jesuit symbol is a total solar eclipse. Which is why all of it makes sense to the point that this is the eye. But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Full of darkness. Therefore, the light that is in thee be darkness. How great is that darkness. This is the eighty-eight. It all comes back to his symbol, 
which is a false sunlight morning star, which is a total solar eclipse, which goes, and that's another thing, goes back to the second Exodus study that I went over last week. And once again, if you're watching this, you got to go watch that. It makes even more sense. So in plain sight, this is the false light, the light that is covered by darkness. And so now, before continuing with that idea, I wanted to, and then we're going to finally get to the feathers. But you know me, I want to make sure we're well-rounded and we have full understanding of what we're getting into. So now I want to read one more article here, uh, just establishing this whole understanding that we've been talking about the last, like, 30 minutes. The great eclipse that does the crossing is the 8th of April in 24. All right. The British Crown Empire and the City of London Corporation. So just like um, America's a corporation, same, same idea. World, uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, we'll just get, I'm just going to get into reading. I think this is some good information here. So I just want to read it so we all can have wisdom. World politics today is governed by the Vatican. World politics is today is governed by the Vatican. It's very obvious that the Vatican runs the world. It is the great head on the eagle. But also by the crown empire, which is London Corporation, which is what the U.S. is under. The modern world of so-called Western civil Civilization began at the end of the 17th century with the blossoming of the British Empire. Oh, this is the article that talks about China is under the, that, well, let's just get to it. <laughs> that empire actually began several hundred years earlier with the establishment of the city of London, which is now an 800 year corporation. So, wow. So, yeah, that's what I was talking about. City of London has been a corporation. Uh, a, a sovereign state, and the Vatican was a sovereign state even before that, but it had a daily, it had its daily wound, which was revived. That controls finance, the economics of the world from an entity called the crown. This entity is the creator and controller of the Bank of England, the U.S. Federal Reserve, the World Bank, the European Union, and various cartels and corporations across the earth. The crown identity is kept most secret. The Crown Bank of England took and assumed control of the United States during the Roosevelt administration when its agents who were really crown agents took over 25% of America's American business. And once again, like ain't this, this is a nice illustration. This is, uh, it's, oh my goodness, that is a solar eclipse if I've ever seen one. <laughs> and we talked about the white, uh, uh, the, uh, the rider of the white horse in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, this is also Pegasus, a white horse. It's also a sign that we're going to read in a little bit in this, in this article that this is an emblem of the Jesuits. Because, like I said, the Jesuits, is the it, they are Apollo worshipers. Their king is Apollo, the white uh, the, the rider of the white horse, the 88 total solar eclipse. These are all signs of Apollo in plain sight. All right, let's continue. The crown has never been the king or queen of England since the establishment of the corporate body, but the British monarchy is figurehead for the crown. Rules pyramid in Great Britain, it has authority over the prime ministers through a Vatican knighthood called the Order of the Garter. The crown, however, is not the king or queen of England. They are established monarchy of the corporate body. The crown is, is the directorate of the corporation 
and Great Britain is ruled by the crown, the city of London, which controls. So like I said, Great Britain, the UK and city of London is separate, uh, which controls the Bank of England, a private corporation, which is ran by the Rothschilds. The Jews that say they are Jews and are not. Uh, Rothschilds is a confirmed Ashkenazi, by the way. So 100%, Rothschilds is probably one of the top heads in a sense of when it talks about in Revelation 2.9.3.9. There is a private state existing in uh, Britain within the central of London. This city located in the heart of Greater London became a sovereign state in 1694. When King William III of Orange privatized the Bank of England and turned it over to the Vatican banksters who today rule the financial world. The city and the Crown Corporation is not subject to British law. It has its own courts. Like we said, these are sovereign states. They are different. It's important to identify them as such as well. Uh, because the country of America, the country of Rome, the country of the UK are not the three eagle heads, is my point. Uh, its own laws, its own flag, its own police force, exactly like Vatican City and Washington, D.C., Columbia. It's crazy how even this article is pointing out the three eagle heads because these are all working together. The Crown Corporation is also... Uh, set, uh, da, 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 this is extra. We don't need to read about the police and all of that. Uh, yeah, we get the banks. I think there was, of course, Freemasonry. Don't have to, the, the, the headquarters of British Freemasonry is, is in the city of London. Go figure. Um, how far down I want to go? Let me see. I'll read a little bit more. We get it. Yes, the logo of the inner temple is a white horse, the rider of the white horse on the sunburst seal of the Jesuit order. Oh my goodness. The white horse, the rider of the white horse on a solar eclipse. Good gracious, is the king of the Jesuit order. The white horse is a symbol of the British Empire and order of the Garter and Crown Corporation. It is the same white horse, which is the symbol, et cetera, et cetera. This white horse is a uh, Pegasus. And the whole earth is governed by the crown through crown colonies, which belong to the city. The crown empire is, it governs Africa it still governs China and India. The colonies of the earth are really just crown colonies. The United States of America are states of the crown. So just want to point out that this is the entire world that is governed by these, by uh, the three-headed eagle. Woo, okay. Now that we got all that out the way, Think we can wrap our head around all of this now. Let me exit out of this. All right. So now, who? Now we're going to get into. Let me move this over here. Okay. Now we're going to get into the eagle wings. I mean the the feathers on the eagle. And now there's a reason, obviously, I wanted to explain these three heads in detail so we can have understanding on the feathers on why the feathers are the United States of America's presidents, because America is the military power, as we read earlier, that the this eagle is using to enforce its will on Earth. America has never lost a war. Which means this is, uh, you want to know power? What currency have the world used over all currency since America's been in power? The dollar bill. That shows you that America has been given dominion over the earth through the disguise of the three eagle heads. They've been using America as the world power.
to establish their kingdom, which is obviously the uh, fallen angels kingdom. As we just saw, the Jesuits are worshipers of Apollo. So this, all of this is coming to why we've been seeing the 88s and stuff everywhere. It's because all of this is coming into the power of Apollo himself. This is where all, this is the kingdom of the eagle and all of this has been coming into uh, to, uh, uh, fruition. So, and that's the other thing too, everybody was talking about how, you know, the eagle, the eagle's emblem is everywhere. America, all these countries, you can go and look and they all use the eagle emblems. So now going into the eagle feathers, this is probably the uh, somewhat complicated part. Well, let's go up a little bit. Oops. Okay, so we have Okay, we already spoke about Okay. Where where do I want to start? Excuse me. Let me let me look real quick. Okay, right here. Here we are. All right. So I already said we have uh, 12, 20 total feathers, but we're going to look at the first 14 because they are divided as such, as it says right here, the 12, the 12 feathers and the two little feathers was no more. So we're looking at just the 14 feathers because the 14 feathers are discussed and then is separated from 14 to six as we see right here so we're going to go over the 14 feathers and then we're going to go over the six when we go up we see that let's remember now family that this starts off when the head became complete in 1929 So this starts in 1929, exactly, I don't think by a coincidence, of President Hoover. We go back, it says, and I looked and behold, on the right side, there arose one feather and reigned over all the earth. And it was so that when it rained, the end of it came and the place thereof appeared no more. So the next following stood up it rained and had a great time. And it happened that when it rained, the end of it came also, like as the first, so that it appeared no more. Then came there a voice unto it and said, Hear thou that has borne rule over the earth so long. This I say unto thee, before thou beginneth to appear no more, there shall none after thee attain unto thy time, neither unto the half thereof. So no one's going to have more time than the second feather. When we start at President Hoover, I mean, it's too perfect. We got Frank, Franklin D. Roosevelt, which is the only president to have four campaigns, which led to the 22nd Amendment. 22nd Amendment states, uh, let me just cut to the point. U.S. Constitution effectively limiting to two, uh, to the number of terms a president of the United States may serve. And um, let me see. Yes, it just talks about Franklin D. Roosevelt had one election, 1932, re-election 1936. And then in 1940, and then again in 1944. So there's only one president that has four terms. And just like the scripture states, there shall be none after thee attain unto thy time, neither unto the half. So no one would even have more than half the time. They, the most they could have is just at that, um, just at that um halfway mark. They couldn't even get more than half of the time that this uh, uh, king reigned. King, like I said, leader, president, 
same difference. And so we go to the eagle. Now let me zoom in. So we have Hoover, 1929, right when the papal seed come back in order. And then we have a long feather, which is right on cue. Roosevelt, which had four terms and no one would have even half the time of more than half or half the time of four terms. Well, I would I will say this. So I say where I get this, the 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 everything else outside of the presidents, I uh I found the pres this president study on someone on you know online on someone's page. But I, you know me, I would I I took all the stuff that I I uh I took the idea of this and I because the, the studies I've seen didn't know what the heads were and whatnot in other interpretations. So I just expounded on this study, which got me started. What got me started on this study is when I saw the breakdown of this size eagle wings. And I was like, man, that's actually right on par. And I actually saw someone break down the percentage of Ezra's getting the timing of this formula right. And, uh, and then they pretty much said it was impossible, pretty much. It had to be the most high scent. So we have right on cue, President Hoover. And then we on the second uh, feather, right on cue, we have Roosevelt, which serves more than any president that could serve up into the half of their time. So let's continue. And then it just goes on to say, there arose a third and reigned as the others before and appeared no more also. And then it kept going. And it says, they just kept going and stood upon the right side that they might rule. And some of them ruled, but within a while they appeared no more. So there's, these are just regular campaigns, presidential campaigns. And then after the, the initial 12, after this, I beheld the 12 feathers appear no more, nor the two little feathers. So they're talking about 14 feathers. And, and the, out of the 14 feathers, there are two little feathers. And this is, the, this is uh, important because this is what gives us confirmation that this is talking about the presidents of the United States. This is how we get the confirmation. So let's really focus in on understanding this. When we uh, going down to the, the interpretation of the two little feathers, let's go to uh, the next chapter, which gives the interpretation. And the two of them shall perish the middle time approaching of the two little feathers. These are talking about the two little feathers. And I mean, you can't, you can't make it any more better than this. So we have... We have um, two little feathers. So if you actually look at this illustration here, which is a pretty decent illustration, we have 14 feathers. We have the long feather that no one will be more than half thereof. And then we have two little feathers, as we just read from the 14 total. It said 12 feathers and two little feathers. So 14 total, two little feathers. And when we go to the two little feathers, is two campaigns that didn't get to finish their presidency, uh, presidential campaigns, which is John F. Kennedy and Nixon, which um, which resigned because he was about to be, um, what's the word? Um, yeah, y'all know the word I'm saying. I don't know why I can't think of the word. Impeached. So the two little feathers happened um, within the 14 total because there was two presidents that didn't get to finish their campaigns. And to confirm, even to confirm these two presidents, we go back to the scriptures, it says, and the two of them, talking about the, uh, the small right here, the small feathers, the two of the small feathers shall perish the middle time approaching, which is talking about the first 14 of the middle time approaching. And then it's separate. This is the, the four. This is separate from, like I said, that's the last six. We'll get to the other wing in a second. So when we even go to the confirmation that there's going to be two that perish before their time, 
and it will be in the middle time approaching. So another way that we can confirm that this is talking about president, uh, the presidents. When we go into this 14 feathers from Hoover to Obama, it is from 29 to uh, 2017. What do you know? 88 years. <laughs> I don't think there's a coincidence at all that is 88 years in this time span. So we cut 88 years in half from this, the first 14 feathers, halfway point will be 1973, which unbelievably lines us up at the last of uh, the, the year before Nixon's uh, res uh, resignation. So it says, it's clear, it, two of them shall perish Middle time approaching of the first 14 feathers because it, it, it separates it. The other ones are separate. So the first 14 feathers, the middle time approaching, both of them will be in the middle time approaching. John F. Kennedy and Nixon. Nixon is literally right in the middle. And John F. Kennedy is right before the middle. So the middle time approaching is where the two fe small feathers will be. And it's literally perfect as all scripture is. Halfway points, 1973, and the two little feathers is at the approaching time of the middle. Wow. Can't get more clear than this, that this is uh, talking to the, the eagle's heads or the body of the eagle is using U.S. presidents and the army of Americas to create control over the whole world, to have dominion over the world. That's what this is suggesting, which is very clear when you look at all the evidence that we have been shown. And we know that, we know as of right now, uh, uh, at least you know, as of late, America seems to be losing you know, control over that, but that's all by, by design. But we know growing up in America, most of us, that America has been portrayed as exactly that, a world dominant, power that no one has been able to control or to put down. But that's the point. That's the world is controlled by demons and devils that this was by design. Right? Good point, Olivia. And all of these presidents are, are related to the royal bloodline of England, which is their masters anyway. The seed of the serpent runs deep all right. All right. So, yes, I think that's to all the uh, what we got so far to confirm. I showed you that the dates uh, add up. The dates add up 1929 when they became a king again to 1929. And then I showed you that the very next uh, president was the long feather that will be more than half of any any other uh, king slash president. And then we went down and we saw that the two short feathers was the middle time approaching. John F. Kennedy and right at the middle, Nixon fits perfectly. And that there will be 14 feathers and it will lead us all the way to Barack Obama. And that's where we're at right now. All right. You know what? I don't need that tab. Okay. All right. So let's go back. Let's go back to the scripture. Okay. And I beheld in low the feathers that were under the wing, thought to set up them um, themselves. Oh, okay. Let me let me see. Where did I leave off at? Um, okay. So going in real quick, I I, I want to make sure we we keep, I keep the visuals going. I want to make sure that we are visually inclined. To look at, so we're about to get into the left side of the eagle, and let's remember that these two will separate themselves, and that's the visual here. 
But there is still, remember, there's 20 total. We just went over the first 14. And there's six more, but two will be separated. That's what we're about to get into now. Okay. And I beheld and lo, the feathers that were under the wing thought to set themselves up to have the rule. And I beheld and lo, there was one set up, but shortly it appeared no more. And the second was sooner away than the first. And I beheld and lo, the two that remained thought also in themselves to reign. And when they so thought, behold, there awakened one of the heads that were at rest, namely it that was in the midst, for that was greater than the two other heads. And we know that's the Vatican. I, I, that's why I was making it very clear that the Vatican was the big head, <laughs> the big head, because it, it, the scriptures make it clear that there is one greater than the other two. And so, yes, the one that is namely in the midst, in the middle of the two is greater than London and Washington, D.C. Very obvious, though. And then I saw that the two other heads were joined with it. And behold, the head was turned with them that were with it, and it did eat up the two feathers under the wing that would have reigned. But this head put the whole earth in fear and bare rule in it over all, excuse me, all those that dwelt upon the earth with much oppression. And it had the governance of the world more than all the wings that had been. Like I said, that could be better translated as feathers because the presidents were feathers, but. And after this, I beheld and lo, the head that was in the mist suddenly appeared no more like as the feathers, but there remained the two heads which also in like sort ruled upon the earth over those that dwelt therein. And I beheld and lo, the head upon the right side devoured it that was upon the left side. And whereas though sawest three heads resting, this is the interpretation. Now we're in chapter 12, the interpretation of what we just read in chapter 11. In his last days shall the most high raise up three kingdoms, and renew many things therein, and they shall have dominion of the earth. Wow, we can clearly understand what this is talking about now. Raise up three kingdoms and renew many things. And those that dwell therein with much oppression, above all those that were before them, therefore are they called the heads of the eagle. For these are they that shall accomplish his wickedness, and that shall finish his last end. And whereas thou sawest that the great head appeared no more, it signifieth that one of them shall die upon his bed. And yet with pain, for the two that remain shall be slain with the sword, for the sword of the one shall devour the other, but at the last shall he fall through the sword himself. All right. All right. Let's get into it. We obviously know that the other side, if we continue the, with the presidents, that it would have to be Trump and Biden. Now let's compare it with scripture. So now we know that um, and after this, I looked and behold, the 12 feathers appeared no more. So now we're done with the other 14 feathers. We already looked at those. We're done. And the, uh, well, the two little feathers, which could be 14. And there was no more upon the eagle's body, but three heads that rested in six little feathers. And then I saw also that two little feathers divided themselves from the six and remained under the head of, that was upon the right side, for the four continued in their place. So four 
continued in their place and the two were separate. And so the first feather was Trump. Let's read about Trump. This is literally talking about Trump. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> Trump is in Bible prophecy. All the presidents are. Um, let me see. Oops, oops, I went too far. I beheld, lo, there was one set up, but shortly it appeared no more. This is President Trump. One campaign, barely even finished with uh, them trying to impeach him. The second was sooner away than the first. This is implying that Biden will not finish his campaign. But you know what, family? If you watch the, if you watch the uh, second Exodus timeline, it happens before the campaign of Biden happens. The, the, the crossing of the eclipse is April 8th, 2004, 2024. The re-election is the, the winner of 2024. Biden will, was never going to finish campaign. And this is what I was implying from the beginning, is that this Bible prophecy totally supports the timeline. And of course it does, because it all is the same story. This is telling us that Biden will not finish his campaign. And he can't finish it, because time will be made, will be cut off. His time will be cut off because the uh, the the Great Reset slash uh, New World Order will happen before the end of his campaign. It totally matches the timeline given in the second Exodus. The second was sooner away than the first. The second won't even finish what the first was able to finish, which is just one campaign. These are why these are small feathers, very small feathers, small campaigns, not much coming from them. And the two that remain, and then, and then, uh, and then you're like, but there's two feathers, right? These are two more presidents. Wrong. So whatever happens to Biden, Bible prophecy is saying that he won't finish at all. And I'm going to side with Bible prophecy. Then we know what happens when a president dies, steps down, etc. We have people that are set up to take his stead, vice president and, you know, whoever, whoever the second person may be. Well, let's read about them. The two that remain thought also in them to reign. And when they thought so, behold, there awakened one of the heads that were at rest, namely it that was in the midst, the Vatican. For that was the greater than the two other heads. And then I saw that the two other heads were joined with it. So now the new world order. I, I said that for my wife. My wife was like, you ain't going to say it like that. <laughs> but uh, the this is the new world order right here, family. Because what happens? The America doesn't need a president no more. It tells you, behold, the head was turned with them that were with it, it did eat up the two feathers under the wing that would have reigned. We're in a new world order. Whenever Biden steps down, within weeks, we will be in a new world order because it won't even allow like the vice president to ever be sworn in as a president. Biden will not be replaced as president, is what I'm saying, family. Wherever we're at, I don't know if we're even going to have internet by then. The day we see Biden no longer president is the time, is, is days, if not weeks away from a new world order being established with the three heads being fully active into being controlled and manipulated by the king of Apollo. All right, um, let's continue, let's see. So yes, 
the 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 papacy is going to eat up so it sounds like papal rome will be in full control at the beginning of new world order with their their green sabbath and and i think that's when when they eat this up uh, this is a whole nother study i don't i don't know if this is going to be next week we'll see but i'm going to go into the sabbath the green sabbath and all of this stuff that the great eagle head is going to initiate at the beginning of this timing right here of them eating up the presidents i mean the people that would be the next president and that's the thing about it this gotta mean the new the new world order because america without a president means we're in a new order it's the only way this that 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 means that and i believe it will happen in 2023 yes The world is a stage, right? We we we're like getting the uh the script before it's played out. <laughs> all right. Uh okay, so all of that being said, let's continue to go down to the interpretation and go into more detail. So we already know the three king the three kingdoms are. Um all right, and whereas thou saw it that the great head appeared no more, it signifies that one of them shall die upon his bed, yet with pain. The Pope will die shortly after the New World Order will be established. I, uh, I mean, literally, it says that he will die in his bed in pain. This is literally talking about a man dying. <laughs> He, the Pope will die because this is the greater head, clearly Vatican City, aka the Papal City, which is in the, in the representation of a man, which is the Pope. <laughs> Everybody's like, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, So, okay, so it said, and then it says, for the sword of the one shall devour the other, but as the last shall he fall through the sword himself. So the last interpretation is that the three, it will, in other words, there'll be uh, some fake wars going on. Uh, London and DC will get into it, uh, or I should say, the UK controlled under uh, under London and America controlled under DC will get into a battle. That's what the sword is. And one of them will fall. If you ask my opinion, I think America will be the last one standing. I think America, that's just my opinion. Oops. I think America is the last shall he fall through the sword himself that's just my opinion we'll see but to each his own with that all right okay so I want to show, yeah, I got the whole, I got this nice visual for y'all at the end. Voila. We have the whole eagle now. We have uh, the time cut short, the longest feather. We have the whole eagle head body. And I got X's here. Let me make these brighter X's. Let, uh, let, it, let everybody know. Ah. They will not rain. And then we have the two little feathers. So I wanted to say this, family. We have these two little feathers that's left. The death one about was about the Pope because this is, it was clearly talking about a head, not a feather. Not saying Biden won't die. Biden could die. 
he could be impeached or anything could happen. I don't know. Um, but the death in, in the prophecy is talking about a head, not a feather. And that's why I, I kept saying over and over again, pay attention to the descriptions of the feathers and the heads and so on, or it's going to get confusing. Know who the three heads are. Know what the feathers are on the wings because, or you'll be confused because this happened to me when I was interpreting it. I was like, oh, I was getting the feathers and, and stuff all mixed up. And I was like, okay, I got it. I got it. All right. Um, I wanted to show what this uh, one last thing. Okay, yes. Um, one second. Excuse me, one second. I want to make one more point. I'm missing something. Maybe it was, I forgot to say it earlier. Bear with me, family. Give me a second. All right. I'm going to, let me, let me see. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and continue. And we're going to, yeah, the uh, the end is going to, I'm going to talk about some feather six and five. So now that's the only thing that's left. Yeah, that's the only thing that's left is feather five and six. So let's finish this off. Okay. Second Ezra is 11, now in verse 36. Then I heard, I don't know why it says head, head of voice. I heard a voice which said unto me, look before thee and consider the thing that thou seest. And I beheld and lo, as it were a roaring lion. Y'all already know who coming back as the lion, right? Chased out of the wood. And I saw that he sent out a man's voice unto the eagle and said, hear thou, I will talk with thee in the highest shall say unto thee, art not thou it that remaineth of the four beasts whom I made to reign in my world, that the end of their times might come through them? And the fourth came and overcame all the beasts that were past and had power over the world with the great fearfulness and over the whole compass of the earth with, with, with much wicked oppression. And so long time, and so long time dwelt he upon the earth with deceit. For the earth has thou not judged with truth, for thou has afflicted the meek, thou has hurt the peaceable, thou has loved liars and destroyed the dwellings of them that brought the forth fruit, and has cast down the walls of such as did thee no harm. Therefore, this is thy wrongful dealing of come up unto the highest. Therefore, this thy wrongful dealing come up unto the highest. That just re read weird for me for some reason. And thy pride unto the mighty. The highest also has looked upon the proud times and behold, they are ended and his abominations are fulfilled. And therefore appear no more thou eagle nor thy horrible wings, nor thy wicked feathers, nor thy mal uh, malice's heads, nor thy hurtful claws, nor all thy vain body, that all the earth may be refreshed and may return being delivered from thy violence, and that she may hope for the judgment and mercy of him that made her. 
Now the interpretation. And uh, well, this is actually finishing because uh, for some reason, th this, if, this is the end, verse 46 of chapter 11, and it finishes in chapter 3 of 12. So the interpretation actually comes in verse 29 of chapter 12. So this is not the interpretation just yet. This is a continuance. And it came to pass while the lion spoke these words unto the eagle, I saw, and behold, the head that remained and the four wings, like I said, feathers, I have no idea why it keeps changing wings to feathers, or feathers to wings. It's two wings and feathers on the two wings. And the four feathers appeared no more, which we just went over. The four feathers appeared no more. So the 14 feathers didn't appear anymore. And then the four feathers, because Biden's campaign will end short, and these two will be eaten up. And two went into it and set themselves up to reign. And their kingdom was small and filled up a fill of uproar. And I saw and behold, they appeared no more. And the whole body of the eagle was burnt so that the earth was in great fear. Then awakened I out of trouble in trance of my mind and from great fear. And I said unto my spirit and we'll stop there. And so we now see that the two feathers were saved for Jacob's trouble. The two feathers, the beast and the false prophet, is, in, is straight up telling us that there is going to be two kings. Let's go more into that now. All right. So the interpretation comes in, like I said, verse 29 of 12. Whereas you saw two feathers under the wings passing over the head that is on the right side. It signifies that these are they whom the highest has kept unto their end. This is the small kingdom in full of trouble. I don't think it's a coincidence that he says this. This is the kingdom that will rule for a very short time during Jacob's trouble. I honestly feel like if you go by off the timeline of second Exodus, that those that make the Exodus may not ever even be around if I don't know what this second Exodus is going to look like. But I think this, uh, the timing of it happens the same time. Like I said, the same time of the Exodus is going to be roughly the same time of uh, the entering of Jacob's trouble. Cause we read that he, he uh, seals his uh, elect before the trumpets, a.k.a. Jacob's trouble begins. So I believe all of this is going to be happening in very fast time, and it's only going to happen for a very short time. And it even says, a small kingdom full of trouble, as thou saw, and the lion whom thou saw if rising up out of the wood and roaring and speaking to the eagle and rebuking her for her unrighteousness with all the words which thou hast heard. This is the anointed... Amen, Mashiach. He, he died as a lamb and he will come back as a lion. I love it. Which the highest has kept for them and for their wickedness unto the end. He shall reprove them and shall upbraid them with their cruelty. For he shall set them before him alive in judgment and shall rebuke them and correct them. For the rest of my people shall be delivered. Shall he deliver with mercy those that have been pressed upon my borders? He shall make them joyful until the coming of the day of judgment. And I believe that's day of atonement. Whereof I have spoken unto thee from the beginning. And we see a little bit of this also prophesied, of course, in the book of Revelation. 19, 19 and 20. I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him, the false prophet. Here's the two feathers. The beast and the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worship his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And if we go up, 
it even says that, uh, yep, the whole body of the eagle was burnt. Unbelievable. I just love, I love scripture connections. The whole body of the eagle was burnt. It's the same story, just different, uh, a different uh, vision uh, of the same beast. And from Daniel to Second Ezra to the book of Revelation. So let's review everything now. We have we have the first uh, 14 feathers, the long, the two uh, times that were cut short. And then we have the first one that didn't rain long, the second one, which won't rain as long as the first. And then his assessors will not come into power that was supposed to come into power after biden is no longer president whatever how that happens then immediately the heads wake up and the new world order begins and when the great tribulation happens jacob's trouble these two kings will come and reign within the bird within the last uh which is going to be either uh london or dc which I'm siding with DC is going to be the last country standing to make war with the lion, which is Messiah with these two head Kings at power leading that army. And that is all. If I had a, I don't know who the two heads are. Let me know if you, what you believe these two, not heads, two Kings. If you ask me, this is my interpretation of one of the feathers. I don't know. I couldn't tell you both of them, but I believe. Um, I believe that the one of the feathers. <laughs> is Mr. 88 himself. I believe Donald Trump is going to be one of the feathers. That's just, that's my guess. When it, it literally says the feathers will separate themselves from the eagle. The, there's a reason why QAnon has, has been revived and they've in the, the Hasatan has been building such a big story with Donald Trump. Not only does Trump equivalent to 88 which has been a theme in this time but he has been separating himself from these presidents and america's evildoers trump has been separating himself through this QAnon movement just as the feathers separated themselves i believe that trump is a hundred percent which also goes in a line that washington dc will be the last head reigning and that Trump will be one of the kings reigning in D.C. at the time that our Mashiach will return. There's a reason why the great X is over America and not over the Vatican or over London. It's over America because I believe America will be the, 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 the land that the great battle will happen and that the person that is separating himself from these these feathers is right in front of us. There's no, there's got to be reason why Hasatan has been putting so much work into this QAnon and Trump movement. They and, and Trump has a huge movement that's worldwide. People think it's Obama. No, Trump's movement is way bigger than Obama's movement. Way. So that's my interpretation. I wouldn't be uh, be surprised if Trump teams up with that false messiah that's in the fake state of Israel right now. I if I had to take an educated guess, it'd be a false messiah from is uh, the state of Israel and Donald Trump controlling the last state. That's where I'm at now, and I mean, like I said, that's just my theory, and um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But everything else outside of the two feathers is pretty sure and accurate that we can see it right now that this is um, 
Yes, Trump is even worshipped as the chosen one. Exactly. And he is pretty worshipped worldwide. Obviously, we're in America, can see it blatantly, but there's people that honor and worship Trump worldwide. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see uh, who is the second. It makes it very clear. And then, like I, I pointed out in the in the in the Bible, how it says that there will be a, a a beast that will rise from the earth that had that looks like a lamb that had two horns like a lamb. The two horns are the two kings, which are the two feathers, which is the beast system in great tribulation. But hopefully, we are all the first harvest, and we won't have to be here. I be, I truly believe. Even if you're even in the still in the states and we're not physically removed, that we will be separated from all the craziness of the beast system of the Great Tribulation, aka Jacob's Trouble, which this is the, which is a short time that they will reign. Right? Uh, Trump is even a part of the coin that's in uh, the state of Israel and all of that. But uh, but yeah. But uh, Shabbat Shalom, family. I pray that this study has blessed you. And uh, look more into all of this yourself. And uh, we'll see what happens with who are the last two feathers. And be ready when we see something. I, I believe Bible prophecy and the timeline given all the way through the second Exodus video. When we see something happen with Biden, whatever it is, know that the time is right here for the new world order to begin.